third phase of moon. Donakin, welcome to Third Phase of Moon. This is a historic interview, let me tell you. We have over 200,000 subscribers reaching 100 million views plus. And now Eric Von Donakin is on Third Phase of Moon. Welcome to the show, Eric. Well, it's a pleasure for me. I'm sitting in Switzerland. It's great to be a member of your circle. Well, let me tell you, the people are... are wondering what's going on in the world right now. Is disclosure about to happen? Eric, you've been on the frontier of this for your whole for years, decades. Tell us what's going on, what's new? <laughs> you see, some uh, two and a half thousand years ago, the Greek historian Herodotus was in Egypt, and at that time he wrote that under the Great Pyramid there is a lake and the lake with clear water, and inside the lake, there is a sarcophagus. Now, nobody believed the word to Herodotus. In the meantime, and that's the news, the lake has been located. I was down there. There is, in fact, the lake with clear water under the Great Pyramid in Egypt, and in the water is a sarcophagus. Unfortunately, the sarcophagus was empty. So some uh, hundreds or thousands of before us, some, some grave rubbles have, uh, were there. Tell me about the sarcophagus. Is uh, the Egyptian government about to do disclosure? What's going on over there with the elections and everything else? Are they going to put out that the Egyptians have been close encounters with aliens for many years, Eric? Uh, of Is course, it? yes. But you see, at the moment... The so-called Department of Antiquity has no chief. Nobody has been selected as the new professor, you know, the head of it. Before, it was Professor Dr. Sai Havas, but he's not there anymore. So, c concerning the public work, the government of Egypt says nothing. Nothing goes to the public. So, I was in the lake under the pyramid. I know the lake does exist. I know, by the way, that in the meantime, we have located by electronic meanings about one kilometer of shafts and little rooms, etc. But the government of Egypt don't go to public. There is no uh, public messages. What do you Dr. Think J, uh, he's with us right now at Third Phase Moon. We really want to thank him for setting this exclusive interview with Eric. Dr. J, any questions for Eric? Oh, absolutely. Right. I've got, first of all, I, I'd like to go back to the beginning, but speaking of the pyramids real quick, what do you think they were made for? Are, are they, some people say that they were an energy source, other people say they're something else. What do you think they were made for? The thing becomes complicated, and we are on telephone interview, so I have to try to make it shortly. According to official archaeology, the Great Pyramid was constructed by the pharaoh of Cheops, about 2500 BC. But there are old Egyptian writers and historians who say something completely different. For example, the writer Ibrahim Abdul Al Makritsi, he lived two, uh, 1400 years ago. He wrote clearly and he, contact, he knew all the old documents that the Great Pyramid was constructed before the Great Flood by a ruler with the name of Saurit. And then he says, Saurit is the same person which the Hebrew call Enoch. Now, Enoch is a fascinating figure for me. He was the seventh patriarch before the Great Flood. And Enoch had contact with extraterrestrials, and finally he disappeared in a fiery chariot from our planet. So these antique Egyptian historians, and there is more than one, they say the Great Pyramid was not made by Cheops, but was made before the Great Flood. By the way, all the other historians, if you read uh, Platon or Strabon or Plutarch or Diodor from Sicily, they all say 
that the old Egyptians did not know who was the constructor of the pyramid because it was made before the Great Flood. And all these figures I just mentioned were historians which all were in Egypt some 2,000 years ago. So the, the puzzle becomes more complicated than we believe. Eric, let me, let me ask you this question. We at Third Phase Moon just recently, via Jimmy Church and some people that did some research via Google Earth, found a massive of what looks to be an alien base of some sort, massive in structure, 1.5 million, uh, 1.5 miles wide, 2. Point, uh, miles wide. Do you think, and this is right off the coast of Malibu, there's a lot of stuff underneath the water. Is there a lot of things that the Egyptian government's not sharing with us, like uh, which is underground? Are there still tombs underneath the cities, secrets to be found? Yes, definitely. Of course. I know some Egyptologists, people who live in Egypt, who are archaeologists, good friends of me, and they say, in reality, we only know about 40% about the ancient history and Egyptian history. 60% are still under the earth. And you know, in Saqqara, there is the step pyramid. But in the desert, under Saqqara, there are kilometers and kilometers of tunnels. And right and left to the tunnels are large, large niche, uh, niches. I also apologize for my English, my German, my, my mother language is German. So there are niches right and left in, from the tunnels. And in these niches, gigantic sarcophaguses. And really, they are tunnels of kilometers. Open to the public are about 500 meters. So the rest is still a secret. You know, Mr. Von Doniken, I'd, I'd like to go to the beginning. I, I, knew, I realized you grew up as a Catholic, and there was a point in your life when you realized that the God that you were taught to believe in, uh, why was he participating in things such as destroying a wall? Can you tell us the turning point in your life? Where you of course. Yes. I was uh, well, for six years in Switzerland in a Catholic boarding school led by Jesuits. And of course, as a boy, I was a deep, deep believer in God. By the way, I'm still a believer in God. I'm still one of these figures who pray. But God, in my youth, had to have some minimum qualities. For example, God is out of time. God does not have to make an experience, and then he has to wait what the result will be. Out, being out of time means he knows the result before or God would never need a vehicle in which to move around from point A to point B, because God is almighty, etc. So these were qualities of God. And then in my school, we had to make translations of parts of the Bible from Greek to Latin and from Latin to German. And I realized that in the Bible, at least, God uses a chariot, for example, described in the prophet Ezekiel. And Ezekiel even describes detail, like the wings, like the noise, like the, the, the feet, like the wheels, etc. Or Moses describes different time when God descends on the holy mountain, it was with smoke, fire, trembling, loud noise, and all these things. So I simply had doubts in my own education. I had doubts in my own religion, and I wanted to find out if other communities in antiquity have similar story. So that was the starting point for me. That's now over 60 years ago, because in the meantime, I'm nearly 80. Well, Eric, you've been on national media speaking about this for, for decades now. What has the major media thought of your story? Are, are they shutting this down? Is it tongue-in-cheek? Is the word getting out? Third phase moon, we... The people are listening. People want to listen to what you think. Is a major media picking up? Is there going to be disclosure? <coughs> well, you see, in the beginning, and at least for the last 25 years, I was more or less always crashed down. And there were always some debunkers, mostly from the religious side, who said, this is all rubbish, that's all nonsense. We were never visited by extraterrestrials. <coughs> because the distances from star to star are too big. Nobody can reach these distances, with speed, and there is no speed of light, and all these uh, natural obstacles. So I was mostly 
uh, disproven. But in the last 10 years, I am very, very happy the situation has changed. As you know, in the United States, you have this History Channel, and History Channel, since three years, they have a series called Ancient Aliens, and it's very, very successful. Or in Switzerland, for example, our biggest newspaper, it has the name Blick. And since three years, I am writing every week a column in this biggest Swiss newspaper, something which, which would have been incredible, impossible, some 25 years ago. Or I have so many invitations, be it for uh, banks or even uh, uh, organizations like the Freemasons, or I myself not the Freemason, but I'm high invitation there, or be it on, on universities. So the situation has changed. I am very, very happy to be alive. My brain functions, and uh, I still run around the world. All your work is finally being used for ancient aliens, and this is a two-pronged question. How do you feel that after 35, almost 40 years, your work is finally being taken seriously here? And also, the, f the second part is, when your work first started, your Chariots of the Gods was published, what countries were taking your work seriously? Excuse me, what countries what? What countries started taking your work seriously from the beginning, and how do you feel that the U.S. is finally taking your work seriously now with Ancient Aliens? You see, it all started in uh, March 1968. That's long, long time ago, when a serious German publisher decided to come out with the book. Before the publication in German language, 25 German and Swiss publishers rejected the manuscript. They said, no, this is an impossible hypothesis. This is just all speculation. So they rejected. And finally, a big German company said, we should do it. We should bring these ideas of Mr. von Däniken into public. And then it started. And very, very, after five weeks, it was bestseller number one on every German uh, bestselling list, including Switzerland and Austria. And the next step was the United States. They came up with Chariots of the Guards. And then was a movie made with the title Chariots of the Guard. And it went on and on. By the way, at that time, on the beginning, I was the manager of a first-class hotel in Switzerland. Because from my family side, we came from the hotel business. And in the beginning, after my high school, I was studying cook, waiter, receptionist, you know, all these things which you need as a hotel manager. Now, after the success of Chariots of the Gods internationally, I give up my uh, career as a hotel manager, and I simply worked strong in what I did. And the result in the meantime are 36 titles worldwide. I'm happy and grateful. Well, Eric, you, you, your work has been extraordinary over the decades again. We at Third Phase of the Moon have been working on a movie ourselves right now about the alien abduction phenomenon. We're, we're basing it on true stories of what's going on around this planet right now from people like you. You've had contact with. They're telling you the stories, the scripture, the, the evidence is there. It's been there for years. And we're, we're doing that right here at Third Phase of the Moon. The world is listening. We have actually a correspondent of Third Phase of the Moon from London, and he has a question for you. Go ahead, Johnny Webb. Welcome to Third Phase. Johnny, you there? You on mute? Yeah, hi, Hello. Mr. Von Gallen. Good afternoon to you. Yes, I'm listening. I have difficulties to hear you. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. It's, it's the connection here, but I hope you can hear me now. Um, now it's okay. One of my, one of my questions huh? is, is obviously with, with the overthrow of Mubarak, and, and you know, I wondered, would, was there any pillaging of antiquities in Egypt? Um, and you said that, that you know, Mr. Zawi is not no longer the head of antiquities. What, what's happening there now? I don't know. I was in Egypt last time four months ago, and I have asked what is going on with the Department of Antiquity, and I received no uh, uh, satisfying answer. So I really don't know what's going on. There, there was a gentleman that's been uh, doing a lot of work on the um, elongated heads of Paracas, and he's been doing a few uh, missions to, to Egypt, and, and he, him and a few other gentlemen 
they, they've been going down into some caves. And these caves, like you said, you know, they go for miles. But instead of tunnels, these are caves. Do you have any information on that at all? No, no, unfortunately not. But all I know is the tunnels beneath Chakara. I know that there is a lake under the Great Pyramid. And I know by electronic means, we have measured one kilometer of shafts and little rooms inside the Great Pyramid. But if you see, some 14 years ago, a small robot of a German engineer entered into a small shaft in the Great Pyramid. It went 62 meters, climbed up inside the pyramid, and came to a standstill before a little door. Then, uh, National Geographic Society from the United States constructed a second, a new robot. This new robot made a hole into this door, and they found behind the door nothing but after 23 centimeters, another door. So door num number two. And in the past two years, a rich man from uh, Singapore financed again another robot. And this robot made a hole into this um, door. And behind it, they could, uh, we, we could see with, with uh, small cameras, behind it is clearly a room with polished walls. And on one of the wall, you see red writings. But these writings are not hieroglyphic. So they cannot be from the time of Cheops, because in Cheops' time, they were writing hieroglyphics. So we still stand before a mystery. Now these shafts who go up there, they are so small that nobody can uh, go in there. No human. You always need robot. You see, one side is only 14 centimeters length. So you need high tech to go in there. And to me, all this makes sense. The ones who planned the pyramid, they were so fantastic planning that they knew exactly only a high-technology high society can reach these rooms. A society without high-tech can never reach these rooms. So the time is right. Uh, Eric, Mr. Donakin, Blake Cousins here again, third phase of the moon. What you're saying, Eric, is that it's impossible for these structures to have been built back in the day. 8,000, 10,000 years ago. How old are these pyramids, Eric? <laughs> Nobody knows. You see, we have all the usual stories, which you don't have to repeat here, with wooden rollers and strikes and all these things. And theoretically, it is possible that a bunch of humans uh, made these things. But what is absolutely not possible is the planning the inside, the engineering, because before you start to make a big construction with many rooms and, and halls and so on, you need the engineers to plan it. And this is absolutely not possible for Cheops' time. You see, Cheops was uh, living about 2400 BC. His father was Snorfu, and Snorfu came right out of the Stone Age. There was no uh, technological evolution for all this. So we still have the mystery, and we are right to ask the questions. You know, Mr. Von Donikin, several years after you wrote your book, uh, Zechariah Sitchin wrote his book, and I wanted to ask you what you think of his theories. Were they based on yours, or do they conflict? What do you think of his translations? Well, I knew him very well, and uh, we were together for many, many hours in Switzerland, in Germany, but also in the United States. And I admired him all the time. I was not of his opinion concerning uh, the 12th planet, because in the 12th planet, Zachariah Sitchin suggested that there is an unknown planet in our solar system which has an orbit around the sun of 3,600 years. And that seemed to me impossible. If we would have an unknown planet in our solar system, our astronomers would know it because we, we can measure it. We can measure the gravity, we can measure dates, etc. So only in this point, I disagreed with my friend Zachariah Sitchin. In all the rest, his translations of Sumerian uh, cuneiforms and all this, I am absolutely happy with the books of Zachariah. Do you think that uh, NASA's kind of covering up what's going on in Egypt? It's all mission control 
as Zachariah has said in his book, The Twelfth Planet, that it's like a three-stage rocket. The evidence is pretty clear. Is there any more new evidence that's coming out through these uh, discoveries? No, not to my knowledge. But you see, all this cover-up is in reality, I don't call it cover-up. Of course, some scientists and some groups know more than what they give to the public. But it's, it's not directly to call cover-up. They simply are afraid. They don't know, they don't have enough information. And they want to be scientific. To be scientific means always uh, to be reasonable. So somebody, if somebody is not reasonable, if somebody is unreasonable, uh, he is ridiculed. So they are afraid to be ridiculed. Th that's all. They have uh, it's a lake of civil courage. While I am one of these persons which are unreasonable, I ask some unreasonable questions, and I hope the time will give us right sooner or later. I think, Eric, you're right on the button. It's, if you don't ask the big questions, and if you don't uh, create a controversy in its own way of uh, whether we believe the Bible, Christianity, Mohammed... <laughs> You see, well, what is, this is something, let's take, first we have the Jewish religion where it said there is only one God, Yahweh. Then we have the Christian religion, which they say the God has a son, Jesus, and Jesus died for our sins here. Then comes Muhammad, and he says he had visions by an archangel, uh, Michael, and uh, Michael, uh, the archangel told him that the Christian religion is completely wrong, and Muhammad has now the newest religion. Thousand years or thousand five hundred years later, and this just as an example, we have in the United States a new religion called the Mormons. Now again, an angel uh, was seen to uh, Mr. Joseph Smith, who told them the old religions are wrong. So in this case, we have in four cases that said that some angel or some strange being told that the old religion is wrong. So what should you believe? You cannot believe nothing. All that you can believe is outside there, in the beginning of the universe, there is a force which we respectfully call God. But the human religions, this is just human wishes, human dreams, human writings. Practically not much of it is true. Do you think that the ETs created us just as the Sumerian tablets were uh, said? Yes and no. It's too complicated. Of course we have evolution on this planet. And do not, I, I do not doubt that we are a product of evolution. But there are two main questions. What started evolution? And here we have a theory that the original message, you see the DNA, has come from outside. So evolution did not start on our planet. The information was coming from outside. So we grow up in an evolutionary way, and then some, some thousands and thousands of years ago, an extraterrestrial spaceship arrived here. As expected, they found life on this planet. And as expected, there was one form of life which was the most advanced one. For example, Cro-Magnon uh, uh, man. Now they took one exemplary, and from this one exemplary, simply one cell. They changed this cell. You know, you all, all what you have to change is the, the, the basic. There are always four bases in the DNA. Every genetic knows, and every genetic would be able to do it. So they changed the, the cell. They put the cell back into a liquid of nourishing. Later, it was put into the womb of a female of the same species. Now this female gives birth to a child, and the child has, of course, the evolution. It has the body, the skeletons, and all these king things. But because of the uh, artificial mutation, the child has something in plus, which the rest of the family tree, let's say the gorillas, the chimpanzees, etc., does not have. Now you have a new branch. Soon, as you will... If you wish to continue a new branch, you need at least two of them, one male and the other female. And then you land in the legend of God created Adam and Eve. So we are product of evolution, but not only. 
in the course of evolution, there were artificial uh, mutations. Eric, let me get this straight right here at Third Phase of Women, because people want to know the exact point of Homo sapiens, people, humans, like we exist right now. I think right now, in my opinion, that we're still continuing in this life and evolution, as you say. But was there, when was the intervention, when was the genetic engineering taking a rib from man to make woman? I don't know. And that's a question which the, the genetics should solve. I really don't know. Because of my researches in ancient uh, religions and the ancient mythologies, I know that the gods created humans according to their own image. And we have cases. For example, in the Bible, just read Moses 1, 6 or 1, 8, you see there are so, so-called fallen angels. The fallen angels came down to heaven and they had sex with humans. And the same thing in the book of Enoch. Enoch describes that 200 of the guardians of the sky have come down to earth. He gives even the names of 36 of these 200. And these uh, 200 had sex with humans. Now, to come back, if some extraterrestrial species has sex with humans, that would mean that the sexual apparatuses of the others must be the same to us. Other way, you cannot have sex. You, uh, sex without a product. So they were similar to us. And that's exactly what the old religion says. God or the gods created man according their own image. All through we are product of evolution. It's all not coincidence. The starting point of evolution was coming from outside. And during the course of evolution, some artificial mutation were made. Now you ask for a date. I don't have a date. I know that we were visited at least three times in the past. The first time, maybe about 16,000 years from now on. And then again, two or three times. The last visit, probably about 3,000 years from now on. But I don't know when the, when the mutation took place. That's a question for the genetics. How many different species do you think have visited us over the years? I don't know that either. Really, I don't know uh, which, what kind of species have been here. But more or less, they looked all humanoid. We, it doesn't matter if they had maybe seven fingers or, or four arms, but they had a head, they had a body, they had arms, they had legs, they had the ability to speak, etc. But how many different species, nobody knows. I wanted to go back to, uh, obviously, the, the, like you said, they were humanoid. They had to use the same, uh, the same genetic or genitals that we did to have sex. But you mentioned fallen angels. Does that imply bad angels? Uh, do you think that there was bad factions versus good factions that visited us? They, uh, something like angels did never exist. The word angel is simply a translation out of the religious context. You see, when you have designs of beings from outer space, for example, in cave paintings, thousands of years old, you see uh, some beings coming down with wings and around their head, there was something like a halo. Now, in the writings, we call these beings angel. Angels are messengers, messengers coming down. And in the Bible and other texts, some of these angels had sex. So they were no spiritual thing. We should change the word angel and write it new extraterrestrial. And an archangel, what is this? The leader of a group of extraterrestrials. We have in the past different picked, uh, um, humans who were taken up into the heaven. For example, Abraham was up in the sky in the heaven. He was teached there and they brought him back to the earth or Enoch, the same figure, or in, in the Hindu mythology, Archuna, they were all taken up, they received some scientific knowledge, and they returned to earth again. So heaven is not the place of happiness. Heaven is not the place which we go, which we go after we are dead. Heaven is space. So we change the word like angel, 
archangel, heaven into space, and so on. We just have to change about 10 of these words, and the old texts become a new meaning, at least according to my knowledge. So angels, real angel, I mean messengers from a real omnipotent uh, almighty God, never existed. I definitely agree with you there. Every instance or mention of angel in the Bible is more than likely an extraterrestrial. When they mention coming down from the heavens above, I always believe it was just coming from the sky. Bronze shields that, you know, obviously, like you said, the, the chariots. But at the same time, the, I wanted to ask you, do you think that there was good factions, good, good extraterrestrials visiting us that were giving us the wisdom v versus bad ones that came here for a reason unknown, maybe to harm us, or do you think all of them were here for good reasons? No, no, there were bad ones too. Among the book of Enoch, now Enoch, you have to understand, is a religious book because it was translated in a religious way, but you can look at, at the book of Enoch in another way, not in the religious way. So according to Enoch, there was something like a mutiny, some 200 of these extraterrestrials, they neutered against their boss, against the commander-in-chief. They came down to earth. They had sex with our women, which was forbidden. And as a result, the highest, which means not God, the highest is the commander of the spaceship, he ordered to destroy the earth by a great flood. So we have different uh, characters there, some good ones and some bad ones. By the way, the survivor of the great flood, at least in the Bible, is Noah. But Noah was the product of an artificial mutation. This you can clearly prove because some 50 years ago at the Dead Sea, they were found Dead Sea Scrolls. And one of the Dead Sea Scrolls is called the Lamech Scroll. Who is Lamech? Lamech was the father of Noah. And Lamech... After some months, he came back to his home tent, and his wife, with the name of Batenosh, had just given birth to a child. And Lamech said to his wife, this child can't be my child. This is impossible. I was away for more than the months. Uh, it's not t uh, possible. And the child looks different, has a different skin, different eyes, etc. But the woman, Batenosh, sweared to Lamech, that no one touched her sexually. She even says, not another shepherd, not uh, nobody, not a soldier, nobody touched me. So Lamech goes to his own father, that's Methuselah, and tells him the story in the family. Methuselah doesn't know the answer and goes to his father, so the grandfather of Lamech. And this was Enoch, again the same Enoch. Enoch says to his son Methuselah, go back to your son Lamech, tell him that the guardians of the sky have made a changing in the womb of Batenosh, an artificial changing. They did not touch her sexually. And please keep this child, give him the name of Noah, because he will be the survivor after the great flood. So it was all planned. I'm glad you brought up the Great Flood. Uh, for, first, recent studies have now shown that there was a period of time when Neanderthal lived on the same planet as Homo sapiens. And since every religion has a mention of a Great Flood, I wanted to ask you your perspective. Of, do you think the, the Flood was to get rid of the Neanderthal to make room for the genetically altered Homo sapien, which you just mentioned? Yes, I, I really think so. You see, in Central America, we had the Maya. And in Europe, we had the old Greeks, Plato, Socrates, etc. In his books, Plato clearly says and describes the destruction of mankind by a great flood. But the Maya in Central America say the same thing. But between old Greece and Central America, there was no contact at that time. In South America, we have a tribe which is called the, the, the Kogi Indians. They live in Colombia. And the Kogi Indians, they have the same story again of a great flood, which have the Maya in Central America, and which has the, Greece, the, uh, the Greek in, in Greece. So there are many other of these examples. The great flood was written and handed down by several societies which had no contact together. 
and they all say it was a punishment. Some God punished the earth. He wanted to destroy something and restart again. Johnny, you got a question? Johnny was on mute. There you go. Go ahead, Johnny. Yeah. Hi, Mr. Rod Mannequin. Sorry, I was, I was actually listening in at the time. Um, yeah, a few of the questions I wanted to go back to, because what we're talking about, you know, um, I noticed that in England we have a lot of crop circles here. And I remember one specifically, which was at Chillabolton Telescope in England. This crop circle appeared, which seemed to be the, the representation of an alien form in the same context as what Carl Sagan had sent up on one of the Voyager missions. And so this uh -huh. was placed on the Earth and it showed the alien, it showed their DNA, their structure and composites and what they looked like. And they, you know, they had a bigger head, but they inevitably had, you know, a head and arms and legs. So they did look like okay. us. I wondered what you thought about this. Of course, as we all know, among the crop circles, we also have some falsificates. And we know the people who make them, who falsificate them. But on the other hand, there are many crop circles which appear just overnight in a short, short period. And these are, are fantastic messages by someone, and we are stupid enough not to answer. Our scientific community is always afraid to take things like crop circles serious. I take them for serious, at least the real ones. Somebody is trying to tell us something, and we are too stupid to understand it. By the way, in Peru, there is an old museum in Ica. Ica is a city about uh, 400 kilometers south of Lima. And on this museum, you find engraved stones. Some of them are really old. Others are, again, falsificates. But you can clearly differentiate the engraved old stones and the modern one. And there you find the similar symbols as we have it on the crop circle. On the other hand, I'm a specialist of Natska, Natska in Peru. And in Natska, we have two designs which again appear in the crop cir circle. So it is fascinating throughout thousands of years that we receive the same messages. I, I definitely agree with you. P I can't, it's, it shocks me that people dismiss them as natural phenomenon or all of them hoaxes when clearly some are not. Because now they've div discovered a way to see if it's real or hoaxed. If the stem of the wheat is not broken, uh, which a lot of the real ones are not, is not broken, it's just growing sideways, that's the proof right there. So nonetheless... As you know, over the last 70 plus years, the activity of UFO sightings, the amount of crop circles have increased, uh, other activities such as you know alien abduction, if you believe that. And I wanted to ask you, what do you think the world is coming to? Do you think we're getting ready for open contact? Yeah. You see, at the moment, and I mean since at least 40 years or so, we are under observation. Somebody is watching us. But again, the scientific community does not take this for real. And as long as the scientific community thinks that we are all uh, cranks and crazy, so it does not enter into the serious press, into the serious media. But we are up, up under observation, and I think we have enough clear indication, not only the UFO cases, some of them are very, very serious and clearly scientifically proven, not only by this, but also by the old uh, uh, traditions. You see, when Francisco Pizarro, he was the conqueror of Peru, for the first time went to Peru, the natives believed that he was a returned god. They all felt on the ground and admired him. Later they understood that he was not god. The same thing in Central America. Francisco Pizarro, he was the conqueror of the Maya and the Aztec. At the beginning, the Maya believed that some gods are returning. The same thing in the South Sea with James Cook. In Egypt, it doesn't matter what. You can go throughout the, the world whenever the first contact took place between the white and the so-called natives. They believed that we are some gods. So the expectation of the return is not the Christian invention. It happened long before Christianity. And today, in our big religions, we have the same situation. Again, I was educated as a Catholic. The Christian community is waiting for the returning of Jesus. 
But the Muslim community is waiting for the returning of the Mahadi. The Buddhist community is waiting for the return of Buddha. The great old religion of uh, the, the Judaism, they are waiting since 5,700 years of the returning of Messiah. So not only the old cultures which died out had this expectation, also our today's living religions. Now, to be honest, not every religion can be right. Some of them must be wrong. And I say they are all wrong. Neither Jesus or, or Mahadi or Buddha or Messiah is returning. Simply the extraterrestrials will return it. They promised it some thousands of years ago to our forefathers. And now in our time, we are observed again. They are studying our technologies, maybe some of our languages, some of our humans, some of our weapons, some of our viras and bacteria, etc. But we are under observation. And I think it's reasonable to take this for serious and to be prepared for such an event. If we are not prepared, we are simply shocked. That's the shock of the gods. And there is another way. We don't have to be shocked. Simply inform humans what is going on. I agree. I think open contact is around the corner. And all, like you said, there's no way all these religions can be right. Obviously, uh, they have to be wrong. Most of them have to be wrong if one of them is right. Or like you said, all of them are wrong. And maybe the Messiah that they're all talking about is the return of the Space Brothers. Now, I... There's a if wall could, if in I Peru. Could, John, John, I'm so sorry. I don't mean to interrupt you. Uh, I would like to carry on with that same topic there, Mr. Von Daniken, because I was brought up a Christian, and I thought that what I saw in the Bible was that it said this. In the end times, the whole world shall be against Jesus when he returns. And it said that he shall return through the clouds. So my understanding is, is we're being psyched up on a, a global scale with media, to, to, to fear the aliens, to fear uh, these watchers, these observers. And so I've got a feeling that if Jesus was to come back in the clouds, we'll end up shooting him down with a scalar weapon because we're so frightened of, of what is of the outside coming in. So, you know, do you have a, any, any answer to that? Well, I don't think that Jesus will return. Some extraterrestrials will return. In the Bible, of course, they use the word of Jesus because Jesus according to their religion, is God or the son of the God. But not Jesus will return, someone else will return. There's a wall in, in Peru, I'm sure you know of it. I don't know the name or the city it's in, but it has four layers uh, representing four civilizations. The bottom layer is so perfect and the blocks are so perfectly aligned, you can't fit a human hair. Above that is the ancient Inca. A civilization which is just a, a bunch of rocks put together ready to collapse above that is where the the Spaniards took over uh, in the you know 15th century 16th century and above that is the current one out of all four including the current wall the most advanced one is the ancient one I wanted to ask you did <laughs> we have some sort of ancient technology that we lost definitely yes you see, every technology has a certain evolution. People have to learn. Once we were cavemen, then we in invented the bow, we invented the spear, we slowly learned how to work with, with the soft stones and then with hard stones. So it's all a question of evolution in, in technology. And in that case, in the highland of uh, Peru, I know it very well, the evolution of technology is turned upside down because the most perf perfect blocks are the oldest one and they have been transported of a distance of at least 40 kilometers and some of them have a weight of 30 tons so stone age people had no possibility to move to transport the blocks they do not did not have the tools to polish hard rock like granite or andesite it's absolutely not possible for Stone Age time. Now, when the Spanish conquerors come up to Peru, they were standing before that great wall. And among them was the last Inca ruler. And they asked the Inca ruler, who made this? 
What is it? Is it a temple, some holy place for you? And the Inca ruler said, no, this is not made by us, not made by our people. The gods did it in one night. So that's the answer of the Inca, the ruler. So they themselves did not did it. Somebody else do it, did it. You see, when our mountain climbers, they go to Himalaya, for example, they have their rucksack, you know, their back paper, back, and they have some instruments, maybe cameras or lights or flashlights or whatever. They don't want to take all this heavy weight up to the mountain. So they always make a certain basic camp and they pose it for some instruments. Later, they take it back again. The same thing happened for an extraterrestrial crew. They studied some groups. They don't want to move all their technology the whole time. So they simply, with their tools, they made something, a wall, some room which, uh, in which they could deposit their high technology that it is not destroyed, be it by animals or humans. And with their technology, they were able to do it in one night. Now when the gods, the so-called gods, disappeared, the natives came and say, hey, this was a holy place, look at these walls, the God made it, maybe they will return here. So now the natives start to construct temples. So you have a broke in uh, evolution of technology, and you clearly can make the difference what is Inca, what is pre-Inca, and what is not from our uh, planet, because of the tools. Yeah, I've been following this work from Brian Forrester, who's working out in Cusco in Peru, and he's been sort of like bringing this to attention. Uh, He he shows elongated skulls of of what he calls the Paracas people. I I wondered, like, um, you know, do you think that these are possibly alien hybrids because they're so different than our skulls? Or or is it, you know, the old saying that they've got a bigger brain, so they needed a bigger head, you know? What what, what do you (laughs) think, Mr. Von Daniken? You see, I just make a little detour. In uh, 827, our time, for the first time, the Great Pyramid was open. It was an uh, Egyptian ruler. His name was Al-Mamun, who entered there. And in his biography, biography, they said he found three sarcophaguses, and inside were the mummies of three human-like personalities. But all the three had big, long heads. So this is handed down. Now we know that these elon, uh, elongated skulls, these deformated skulls, were found worldwide, not only in South America or Cusco or Peru, also in Egypt and elsewhere. And we know that some of these elongated skulls were really made by humans because they wanted to look like their gods. So they pressed the, 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 the head of the babies together in, in, in two wood plates, etc. But the problem is the brain did not become bigger. If you have a bigger head, the brain still has the same volume as before. The brain does not become bigger. So in the rest of the head, you simply have water. It's a water head, which means it becomes an idiot. So we have to differentiate. We had elongated head, which were real extraterrestrials, the one which were found in Al Mamun in the Great Pyramid. And we have other elongated head, which were made by the humans. But soon as the children grew up, they have become idiots. Johnny, you had something else. Go ahead. Yeah, it was just that. Yes, it was. It was that with the, some of the elongated skulls that was found in, in, in Cuscus, they noticed that some of the children's skulls that still had this shape to them um, had teeth. And that some of these children were very young, six, five, six-year-old children, but they had very formed adult-type teeth. But they still maintained this head shape. Uh, you know, from a very young age. So it's not as if we're following, say, like a, 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 an African tribe where they put rings around their neck and yeah. over the years, the neck stretch. These heads were, were sort of formed from a very young age. Yeah, yeah. That's you true. Know, but, but, yes, by ahead. the way, gentlemen up there, I have to leave in about five minutes. Okay, we'll, we'll wrap this up shortly. I, Akhenaten, King Tut's father, clearly had a, uh, a elongated head. Now, do you believe he was an extraterrestrial that started spreading his DNA through his children? Yes, in this case, yes, because he was a king. Excellent. Johnny? 
I'm still thinking about something at the no moment. But, uh, anyway, please carry on. Mr. Von Doniken, what are some of the best places you visited and seen some of the most uh, technology from the past? Until today, we have no hard facts which was left on the earth by extraterrestrials. We have wonderful sculptures. We have wonderful temples, pyramids, and all this. But this was made by the humans, not by the extraterrestrials. I never found an extraterrestrial artifact. I mean, some kind of tool or something technology. I would be happy to have it, would be proud to present it to the scientific community. So all what we work with it are indications. And among these indications, absolutely sensational is the plaque, the tomb plate of Palenque. Palenque is in Central America, in Mexico, and there is a pyramid called the Temple of Inscription. And in 1952, deep beneath this pyramid, a tomb was found. And the tomb was colored, uh, covered by a big stone plate. I mean big, 3.8 meters long, 2.20 meters large. So a big one block. And on this stone block, a gigantic chiseling. You see a man sitting on a chair, bending forward, almost like a rising motorcyclist. He has some mask on his nose. He uses his two hands to manipulate some control. And at the end of his vehicle, you see something like a linking flame coming out. This now, in 1952, well. when this was discovered, archaeologists said it is Pakal. Pakal was the second last ruler of Palenque. And Pakal is entering into the earth. So he's dying. In the meantime, 14 different scientific explanations have come up to explain this mystery. But the newest explanation comes from the professors Stuart and Stuart, because it's the father and the son, and they are the world's most expected, respected epigraphs. Epigraphs means translators from Maya language. And they clearly say now the whole stone has only to do with the universe, with the cosmos. And the, the person sitting there is in fact Pakal. But Pakal is not entering into the earth. Pakal is entering out to the, universe, to the universe. He's flying away. So for the eyes, this is absolutely sensational. The tombstone of Palenque. I agree. There is so much evidence out there. It's just a matter of time before we wake the world up. Just a few more questions. What is next for you? I do know you're speaking at Contact in the Desert, which is why we're interviewing now, because we are giving away one ticket per week per show and featuring one speaker. What are you going to be sh sh uh, telling people, aside from going in depth of what we're speaking, at Contact in the Desert, as well as what's next for you after that? Well, I'm, uh, you mentioned con contacting the Joshua Tree, and uh, uh, between the 3rd and the 5th October, there is in Min Minneapolis a Paradigma Symposium. And on October 11th, I am in Virginia Beach speaking at the Edgar Gacy's Foundation. But this is all open to the public. Excellent. Well, that, you know, that was my last question, if you don't mind me asking, Mr. Von Daniken. The, the Edgar Casey mentioned before he died that they would eventually find something in the heel of the, the Sphinx. And I noticed that they found a small hole and opened it. Do we know what was true. inside there? No, they found the, the, a small hole, but only by measuring from, from upside. Nobody was in the small hole because the uh, Department of Antiquity was forbidden to make uh, forbid to make make a hole. So we don't know what's inside. At least I don't know. Maybe if they open it, it it is a secret. They have not communicated to, to, to the public. Mr. Von Donegan, it's truly been a pleasure. I know we just scratched the surface. We definitely have to get more from you in the future. I just wanted to tell you, it, it, give, it, do you have one message you'd like to give to all the listeners and viewers of Third Phase of Moon? Of course. Look, on this wonderful planet Earth, we have millions, billions of people living. And generally said, you can differentiate these millions of people into two groups. One group is the religious group. It doesn't matter what kind of religion. The other group is the scientific group. Now, the religious group has been told that God made everything. He made the universe, the planets, the plants, the trees. But as crown of creation, God made us humans. And the scientific group, 
They know everything about evolution, mutation, selection. But on the top of evolution, we, the human race, stands. So have you ever remarked that in both cases, if you look at scientifically, top of evolution, or if you look at religious, crown of creation, in both cases, we look at us humans as the greatest. We think something like us does nowhere exist anymore in the universe. So we think we are unique out there. This is in reality a psychological problem. That's why we have difficulties to deal with extraterrestrials. Even in our brain, we have difficulties to make some working hypothesis because soon as we accept the extraterrestrial existence and that they were here, we are not the greatest anymore. It's a psychological problem. That's what I say as message. We have to return again and to become humble and to learn there are billions of intelligent forms of life out there and sooner or later we will get in contact with them again. Third base of moon.